Registrations are now open for the 6th Bioceuticals Research Symposium to be held in Melbourne on the 27th to the 29th of April 2018. To register, please go to bioceuticals.com.au and click on the Education tab. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining me in the studio today is Dr. Ross Walker, an eminent practicing cardiologist with a passion for people and health, and with over 35 years of experience as a clinician. For the past 20 years, he's been focusing on preventative cardiology and is one of Australia's leading preventative health experts. Considered one of the world's best keynote speakers and life coaches, he's the author of seven best-selling books, a health presenter, in the Australian media, including regular appearances on the Nine Network's Today Show, A Current Affair at Sky News, Switzer Business. He also has a weekly radio show on Sydney's 2UE, 4BC and 2CC, and with other regular segments on, this is going to get tongue-twisting, 2UE, 6PR, 4BC and 3AW. <laughs> Welcome, Ross. Do you have a rest? <laughs> oh, typically not, Andrew, no. <laughs> Welcome warmly back to FX Medicine. How My are you? Pleasure. Now, we're going to be talking a little bit, uh, certainly about cardiovascular disease, but partly about the cholesterol conundrum. Mm. What I'm interested in is residual risk with cardiovascular disease. Yep. But I guess first, can you take us through the prevalence of heart issues in Australia, why we're getting fatter, and where are we heading in the future? Sure. Well, firstly, one Australian dies every 12 minutes of a heart attack or some cardiovascular disorder. It is seriously the commonest cause of death and disability around the world, and certainly Australia is part of that as well. And one of the big problems now is that everyone thinks heart disease is caused by cholesterol, and we've got to dismiss this nonsense. 70% of heart disease is now directly related to the insulin-resistant gene. And here's the problem with insulin resistance. 30% of Caucasians are insulin resistant, 50% of Asians and close to 100% of people with darker skin are insulin resistant. What does that do to you? It increases your risk for diabetes, blood pressure, cholesterol issues. Maybe not a high cholesterol, but cholesterol issues, fat around the belly, so abdominal obesity, the dangerous fat, and then cardiovascular disease and even cancer. So 70% of of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is directly related to insulin resistance. 20%, and this is hardly even tested for in in the Australian medical industry, 20% is due to an elevated lipoprotein little a. So therefore, you can explain 90% of cardiovascular disease when you haven't even mentioned high cholesterol. And here's the problem. Because of this gene and because of the way we're living these days, 70% of Australians are now either overweight or obese of males and 50% of Australian females overweight or obese. And the reason is pretty damn obvious. Food is freely available. All of our celebrations are based around food. We were designed to be hunter-gatherers, wandering around a jungle with a spear for 30, 40 years, having having the the acute feed of killing a beast and, and storing a bit of fat around the belly for a couple of days till the next big feed a couple of days later and a bit of feast and famine in between time. What do we do now? Breakfast, lunch, dinner, sit in our bums all day, biggest meal at night time, sit and watch television. And we wonder why people are putting on weight. It is damn obvious. Sitting is the new smoking. So all of these are ha- these things are happening. So when we get into that paleo lifestyle, yeah. we can't go back. No. We've got to no. live in the 21st century. Of course we do. I have a beautiful car and I like to drive it. Yep. So how do we manage this? What do we do to to reduce the risk or negate these increasing risks okay. of our genes? Well, here's the problem. You see, the medical profession have conned the public into believing that there's a pharmaceutical solution to every issue. If you can't fix it with a script pad or a scalpel, then it doesn't work. And they don't believe in anything else. And this is the reality. If people practice what I call the five keys to ultimate health, we'd be seeing much less disease across the board. Those five keys, I'll go through them quickly, very simple. You cannot be healthy and smoke, drink too much grog or snort cocaine. So anyone who has any addictions to anything is sick. Number two, and we don't talk about this this enough, 
is every night of your life generate a good quality sleep habit. Seven to eight hours of good quality sleep every night is as good for your body as not smoking. Mm. Number three is nutrition. Nutrition is simple. It's called eat less and eat more naturally. Now, it's very difficult in our modern world to eat naturally, but if you can simulate the hunter-gatherer sort of diet as much as you can, and I'm not a great believer in paleo, I just think it's about sensible eating. The best diet with the proven health benefits is the Mediterranean Mediterranean diet. diet. And it's not just the Mediterranean diet, it's the Mediterranean lifestyle. So they have their good sized breakfast of fresh fruits and whole grains. Then they burn off any extra carbs in the hot Mediterranean sun in the morning, come home and have their biggest meal at lunchtime, a bit of pasta, maybe a couple of glasses of red, get a bit sleepy, have an afternoon sleep. Study of 23,000 Greeks, those who had an afternoon sleep had a 40% reduction in cardiovascular disease. Then they wake up and they burn off any extra carbs in the hot Mediterranean sun in the afternoon and don't have much for dinner. Hmm. What do we do? Smallish breakfast, smallish lunch, snack between time because we're hungry, have this huge evening meal and sit in front of television. Now, the body's not like a car. Hmm. You put fuel in a car, use it when you like. But if you put fuel in this car, if you don't burn it off within a few hours, it gets laid down as fat. And so... Nutrition, straightforward. Eat less, eat more naturally. And what should we be eating? Well, of course, basing our diet around fruits and vegetables, two to three pieces of fruit per day, three to five servings of vegetables per day. And people who do that have the lowest rates of heart disease and cancer just by eating fruits and vegetables at that dose. And here's the problem, Andrew. Only 10% of people in the modern world would have that amount of fruit and vegetables Mm, mm, every day. mm. And the rest of the Mediterranean diet is little bits of meat, eggs, dairy, chicken, fish, nuts, and of course the wonderful olive oil with a couple of glasses of red wine. Now I said little bits, mm. but what we do is we overconsume. We eat off big plates, big. Sticking helpings. my hand up here, Ross. <laughs> Sticking my. Well, hand nobody's up. nobody's perfect, I, mate. I love good food, but so I, I have way too much of it. That drive of hunger yep. is amazing. How do you get around that? How okay. do you teach your patients to eat smaller portions? The two great success principles on the planet. Two, only two. Number one is discipline and perseverance. The more you eat, the more you'll eat, the more you'll need to get the same hit. You've got to start disciplining yourself to eat off smaller plates, to eat smaller helpings, not to have second helpings. Don't graze between meals. We're not cows, for God's sake. People say to me, but Doc, I get hungry about 10.30. Get over it. Mm. There's nothing wrong with a bit of hunger. And finally, avoid desserts most of the time. Now, I have a thing called the cheesecake rule. So I think 19 meals out of 21, you should follow follow the the program. The other two, you can relax it a bit. But I love cheesecakes. It's it's one of of my things I really get a strong urge for. Mm. So I would have a a big piece of cheesecake maybe once every three months. And when I do, I reward myself and enjoy it and don't feel guilty. But some people think it's their right to have dessert every day. Mm -hmm. It's just outrageous. Mm. So... I think what you've got to do is you've just got to say, okay, life isn't about making the big decision to be healthy. It's about making 30, 40, 50 small decisions every day. I won't eat that biscuit. I'll walk up the stairs rather than take the escalators. I won't yell at that fool who just cut in front of me in the traffic. Split second decisions that either take you towards good health and happiness or bad health and unhappiness. It's a moment by moment decision. It's not making that new year's resolution, which never works. You've got to wake up every morning, press the reset button and say, I'm going to do it better today. today. Every single day. Now we've alluded to LDL as not being necessarily the bad player that we say. And, yep. and you know, some say indeed it's our friend, but there mm. seems to be this legion of research showing LDL reductions improving lifespan. What's yep. going on here? What's the real story? No. Well, f- firstly, if you look at populations where they've had lifelong low LDLs, they don't get a lot of cardiovascular disease. There's no doubt about that. But here's the issue that no one really has given any decent research to support. If you have someone who doesn't have cardiovascular disease, doesn't, Mm. with a high LDL, and you then reduce their LDL with a pharmaceutical drug, are you doing them any good? So Mm. maybe Mm. they've gone 30, 40, 50 years with a high LDL, and they've got nothing in their arteries. What are we trying to achieve here? Because let me just quote a few studies on LDL cholesterol. So there's a place just north of Mexico called the U.S., And they've done a study that was released in the November edition of the Journal of American College of Cardiology 2015. They took, it's called the MESA study. They took 5,000 people and they followed them for 10 years. 77% of the people in the MESA trial fitted the US criteria to be on a statin because of cholesterol abnormalities. Yep. But half of those people had a zero coronary calcium score. 
Now, coronary calcium scoring is the best predictor of heart disease risk. Now, I've got to make this very important point here. I'm not talking about intravenous CT coronary angiography, which should not be seen as a screening test for heart disease. It isn't. It has no prognostic value over the coronary calcium score. Coronary calcium score is about four or five chest X-rays of radiation, no dye, no injections. Intravenous CT coronary angiography Risk. can be up to 300 chest X-rays of, of radiation. It makes your wallet at least $500 lighter and you glow in the dark for a few days after the test. And it doesn't give you any extra prognostic information. So let's go back to the coronary calcium score. CT scan takes a snapshot of your arteries with no injections. If your coronary calcium score is zero, and half the people in this study had a zero coronary calcium score, half that's, sorry, half the 77% of the people with high cholesterol, zero calcium score, their heart attack rate over the 10 years was so low, despite their high cholesterol, that the conclusion of the trial, statins are worthless for people with zero calcium scores. For primary prevention. So I don't treat cholesterol at all, Andrew. I treat risk. Right. And the best assessment of risk is a coronary calcium score. So all males at 50 or females at 60 should have that as a routine, like you'd get your prostate checked or your breast checks or your bowel checks or whatever. But if, say, for example, you said to me, look, Ross, I'm, I'm a 45-year-old male and my dad had a heart attack at 50, I'd do a calcium score on you now. Mm. I've got a 42-year-old woman whose mother had a heart attack at 48. Anything, any calcium score above 400 serious, her coronary calcium score is 550. So she needs aggressive risk factor modification, not just all the, the five keys of being healthy. I haven't spoken about the last two. Mm -hmm. I'll get to that in a second. Yep. Um, but she not only needs the no addictions, good sleep, good eating. We didn't mention three to five hours of exercise every week and the best drug on the planet's a thing called happiness. Uh, so she needs all of those. And I think all of us need all of those. They're not negotiable for anybody. Mm. But she also needs statin therapy to lower her cholesterol. She needs to keep her blood pressure well controlled, the 120, 130 range at the very most, low-dose aspirin, all the stuff you would give anyone with proven vascular disease because she's already at very high risk. But I don't care what – I've got to tell you another great story. Yeah. I've got a patient who came to see me when she was 58. Her lifelong cholesterol level was 9.5. She'd been on statins. They made her feel dreadful. She couldn't lift a leg. She had aches everywhere. And she said, look, I'm, I'm at my wit's end. My doctors are all telling me I'm going to die if I don't take a statin with a cholesterol of 9.5. And I said, well, let's get a calcium score. Calcium score age 58 was zero. So I said, look, the statins have knocked your body around. You've got a zero calcium score. Clearly, in your case, your LDL isn't causing you problems. You can get the subfractions measured. You can do what you like, but if they've got a zero score, why bother? You know it's not spilling into their artery. So anyhow, for the next eight years, she was told by every doctor she saw, if you don't take Lipitor, you're going to die. The nonsense I hear some GP say. And anyhow, she came back to see me a year ago with having, having heard this, but resisted going back on the statins. So now in her mid to late 60s, her calcium score had rocketed from zero uh, with a lifelong cholesterol of 9.5 up to still zero. Right. And so in her case, the statins were worthless. Yeah. Now, in 2016, a big study came out of the UK published in the British Medical Journal. 68,000 people over the age of 60 followed for 10 years and showed that firstly, if you've made it to 60 without heart disease, there is no link between LDL cholesterol and heart disease. Okay? Right. If you've made it to 60. If, yeah. Because what's that saying is that in your case, your particular LDL isn't atherogenic. So not always is LDL bad. And it's not always small versus large. It's just some people have LDLs that aren't going to hurt them. Some people do. But what it did show, the higher your LDL over the age of 60 without treatment, mm. without heart disease, the longer you live the less cancer you have, the less gastrointestinal disease you have, the less infectious disease you have. Now, the, the obvious question there is why? Mm. What is protecting you with a high LDL over the age of 60? Well, here it is. In healthy people, the covering of the cell, the membrane in a healthy person is 75% fat. I wrote about this in a book in 2002 called The Cell Factor. And The Cell Factor was that 75% fatty membrane acts as a protective coating against outside toxins. So, the sickest people on the planet are not fat Americans, which is what most people say. The sickest people on the planet live in Africa because they're mal 
nourished. The worst thing for your body is to not have enough fat in that membrane to protect you against outside toxins. So it's really easy for HIV, tuberculosis, malaria to cross those membranes and kill the person. That's why they have dreadful mortality rates. They die from serious infection. So if you've got a good LDL coating in that membrane, it's going to stop all the toxins getting in, thus less cancer, less infectious disease, less gastrointestinal disease. And you don't get heart disease if you've made it to 60 with a high LDL. Well, you don't get heart disease from cholesterol. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. In fact, over the age of 60, the major cause of cardiovascular disease is hypertension. So hypertension is really the poorer cousin to cholesterol because we had the blockbuster drugs, the statins released 20, 30 years ago, and every man and his dog whose cholesterol nudges up a bit is put on a statin. I had a phone call on my radio show. This is a, a talking lifestyle on a Sunday night that now goes all throughout Australia, six to eight for anyone who's listening. It's 954 in your AM listening dial in Sydney. But here, let's, uh, sorry. So I had a phone call a couple of months ago from a woman who said a general practitioner, wait for this one, wanted to put her 95-year-old father on a statin because his cholesterol had gone to 5.2. Now, I've got to say to you, Andrew, there is not one shred of science that treating anyone's cholesterol who doesn't Ridiculous have heart waste disease of money. over the age of about 70 has any benefits at all. There's no, there's no science at all. It's complete nonsense. This throwing around these drugs like dishwater. Another trial came out a few months ago, showing that if you treat cholesterol in people who don't have heart disease over the age of 65 with a statin, you increase their death rate. So what I'm saying is that statins should be used, but not for people just because their cholesterol has gone up. So the only people I use statins in are people who have a high coronary calcium score. So a coronary calcium score that puts you in the 25th percentile. So if I've got a 45-year-old man with a strong family history and a coronary calcium score of 50, which is only in the middle of the mild range, he probably needs a statin because he's already got muck in his arteries at the age of 45, yeah. and it's just going to get worse as he gets older. But if I've got a 70-year-old man who's got a calcium score of 200, I congratulate him. It's not a big deal for mm. a 70-year-old to have that. And I certainly wouldn't give a statin to that person, regardless of their cholesterol. But I give statins to everyone with a, a high percentile ranking coronary calcium score, or if you've already had a heart attack, a stent, or a bypass, there is an evidence base that you will benefit from being on a statin. Uh, but the evidence base is nothing like those five keys of being healthy. So if I give you a statin in an average dose, I reduce your risk for a, another cardiovascular event in the 20 to 30% range. If I get you to tighten up your lifestyle with those five keys of being healthy, a recent trial out of Holland called the Morgan study, M-O-R-G-E-N study, showed if you do those five things well, you reduce your risk for cardiovascular disease 83%. So this With is the no thing that gets effects. me. Is that, for instance, we talk about the French paradox. We talk about the Mediterranean diet. But as you mentioned, it's the Mediterranean lifestyle. Yeah. Stress. It's the whole package. Yeah. Oh, stress. Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> I'll get you angry. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the Walker rule number two of medicine is the patient's the one with the disease. It's not my problem. <laughs> but look, stress is, is the big precipitant. And we have so many people saying in the medical profession, oh, stress doesn't cause disease. Give me a break. I, I would hardly ever see anybody who didn't present with some acute coronary syndrome who wasn't under stress at the time. Mm. And, and see, the, the problem with stress in our society is that we live this 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week lifestyle. We, we're on con we're constant contacts, those damn mobile phones or electronics everywhere in our, in our face. You can't get away from it. And, and there are so many choices. Uh, choices are cause of stress as well. You can't just buy a car today. You've got about 30 choices and about 30 different types within the choice. Mm. You can't go and just get a cup of coffee. You've got to, you've got to, whether it's a decaf or a caffeinated or whether it's a cappuccino or a latte, there's just all these stresses from all the choices we've got. And the, ch the, the stress is from people wanting instant answers you didn't reply to my email. I sent it five minutes ago. Give me a break. But but all of this sort of stuff, and 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 I think that those are the the, the situation. We've got these complex lifestyles. We've got complex relationships. We've got complex jobs, even complex travel, and people are just stressed out of their bone. And then they're not dividing their energy properly. And I think our body works well in about eight hours of active energy, eight hours of relaxation energy, and eight hours of sleep. But we're not doing that anymore. I have to go back to LDL yeah, and, sure. and the structure of LDL, yep. of the molecule. The biggest mistake, as I see it, firstly, is that we say that cholesterol is the problem. Yeah. 
rather than lipoproteins. Yep. Is part of the problem what we're doing to the protein, the glycation, the oxidation? Is yeah. that a real issue? I think it's a huge issue. Okay. So when somebody has a, a large pool of LDL, mm -hmm. their levels are higher, yep. they're going to have more of, more numbers of the small, the medium, and the large. Yep. Some will be swayed towards one or the other. Mm. How real is that measurement? Let's now go to the LDL itself. The problem with LDL is that a lot of the data has been grubbied by the people that have familial hypercholesterolemia. They have a defect in their LDL receptor where they're not incorporating cholesterol into the cell, so it spills outside. Now, could it be that that LDL receptor defect is then allowing the, the fat to spill into the arteries, but skewing all the stuff about small versus large LDL? Because then you bring into the mix the whole discussion of saturated fat, which puts up your LDL cholesterol. Now, recently, a few months ago, the Pure study was released by Professor Salem Youssef, one of the most respected epidemiologists in the world, where he looked at 135,335 people in 18 countries over 7.4 years and found that those who had the highest death rates, 28% 20, increased death rates, were those who had the highest carbohydrate intake. The total fat intake, those who had the highest total fat intake, 23% reduction in death rates. Those who had the highest saturated fat intake. What we've been told for years by the brain-dead members of the medical profession who believe this nonsense and nutritionists who believe that saturated fat causes disease. We've been told, we've been told for years, saturated fat causes heart disease. Show me the evidence because it's just not there. Those who had the highest intake of saturated fat in this particular study had a 14% Reduction, reduction in death and heart disease, a 19% reduction with those who had the highest intake of monounsaturated fats, things like olive oil, those who had the highest intake of the omega-3 polyunsaturated fats, 20% reduction in death rate. So I'm, I'm, I'm over this whole saturated fat nonsense, but the problem is when, when you look at the LDL data, large versus small, I think it's been grubbied by the fact that they're not dividing the large LDL people into the people with FH, familial hypercholesterolemia, as opposed to the people who just have a highish LDL cholesterol because they have a fair bit of saturated fat. Familial hypercholesterolemia is not a cholesterol of, say, 8 and an HDL of 2 and a triglyceride of 0.7. That's not FH. Yeah. FH is an a LDL or a, or a total cholesterol of 8, HDL of maybe 1, and a triglyceride that's, pr that's pretty neutral. That's FH. Oh, I thought Triggs was high in familial. No, 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 no. Oh. That's familial dyslipidemia. Ah. I'm talking about fami familial hypercholesterolemia. And the problem with familial hypercholesterolemia is that 50% of people have had a vascular event by age 50. But when you're an optimist, that means 50% of people haven't. So again, even within that mix, there are some people whose LDL doesn't cause them a problem. So this one size fits all. As soon as your cholesterol nudges up, we're whacking on a statin. There's no good science behind it. That's my concern. Now, again, when I have anyone on a statin drug, I put everyone onto a few things to supplement that. I put them onto a thing called Bergamet Pro Plus, and I, I was involved in a study where we gave people 20 milligrams of resuvastatin, so the old crystal, crystal, which is the strongest of the four statins, we reduced their LDL down 56.5%. Then we cut it in half to 10 milligrams of resuvastatin, added the Bergamet Pro Plus twice a day, and got their LDL down 52.5%, but a much bigger rise in HDL and a much bigger drop in, in triglycerides suggesting that we're affecting more the particle size with the bergamot rather than just the statin alone. So it's actually better to be on a statin with bergamot at a lower dose than it is to be on a bigger dose of statin by itself. Also, all people on a statin, I believe all statins do affect your coenzyme Q10. I put them all on ubiquinol, not ubiquinone. Now, ubiquinone, the standard CoQ10, the problem with that is it has to be metabolized to, it has to, be metabolized to ubiquinol but here's the issue. When we hit 50, the diaphorase enzyme that converts you from ubiquinone to ubiquinol starts to drop. So you're not getting enough active ubiquinol in the mitochondria to protect you against the direct statin effect on the mitochondria that causes the muscle aches and pains and also increased risk for diabetes. All, all, all works through what we call the GLUT4 pathway within the mitochondria. So therefore, I use 
ubiquinol in everyone who's on a statin. Now, I personally take ubiquinol. I'm, I'm in my early 60s. I, I'm not on a statin, but I use ubiquinol just to give me energy. So I think it's terrific because it drives that mitochondria. One of the major drivers of the mitochondria is ubiquinol. So I don't think there's any point using ubiquinone in anyone. Use ubiquinol. It's much better data on that. So I thought that ubiquinol, sorry, forgive me, ubiquinone was okay, particularly for a younger group of patients. But once you started to age, that enzyme dropped off and so you couldn't recycle it. Yeah, but why bother using ubiquinone at all when you've got ubiquinol? Just use the active stuff. But but the the data is there. But but mind you, they they did studies on young nurses, um, average age of about 20, and they found that even four weeks of being on ubiquinol improve their stress levels. In young athletes, 100 athletes out of Germany, same deal, that six weeks of being on ubiquinol actually improve their sports performance. So uh, I I think there's better data for ubiquinol. So I think ubiquinone is really probably dead as a supplement these days. I know we're getting off the cholesterol issue, but um, with regards to to ejection fraction, does ubiquinol help ejection fraction? Oh, yeah, there's quite a, quite a bit of very good data about ubiquinol improving endothelial function, improving ejection fraction, improving other parameters of cardiac performance as well. It's not just all about ejection fraction, because when we talk about heart failure, we talk about heart failure with uh, with uh, reduced ejection fraction, that's the systolic dysfunction, and then heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, that's diastolic dysfunction. Right. So it's it's also having effects on all the different parameters of heart failure, and there's much better data with ubiquinol than there is with ubiquinone. But mind you, let's let's be scientific here. There was a study called Q Symbio where they use ubiquinone. Yep. And that, that was in about 400 people, 200 milligrams a day of ubiquinone. And even, even doing that over two years reduced cardiac events by about 50%. Now, if there was a drug that did that, the drug companies wouldn't leave us alone with the information, but mm. that that was just pushed aside and no one's even really acknowledged that stuff in the same way with my Bergamet data. And I'm, I'm, I've got to admit, I have an association with the company. I do all the research with my colleagues in Italy. I'm an honorary Calabrian citizen, so... Mm. Be careful. We Watch have the out. best. We yeah. have the best market. Don't cross I do know your address. <laughs> um, so, 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 but I'm, I'm sa- what I'm saying is that is that uh, we have science, evidence based data for ubiquinol, for for bergamot, and one of the things I also add in is magnesium orotate. And it's not the magnesium, it's the The orotate, which lifts up the ubiquinol in the mitochondria. So you're really giving that mitochondria the best bang for your buck by using a combination of a high quality orotate product with a high quality ubiquinol. Now, another thing that I'm I'm using these days as well, it's the new kid on the block really, is vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 is is also- this is really interesting. Well, well, but, but it's also affected by statin therapy. So I give, and it must be 180 micrograms a day of K2. That's the dose. And it's got to be the Menic Q7 variety of K2. So I use that every day. And basically what I say to the patients, and this is, there's very good science behind this. It takes the calcium out of your arteries and puts it back in the bones where it belongs. And I think that's a really, really good thing to do for people with cardiovascular disease, that, that combination of supplements. So talking about the, going back to the calcium score. Yep. Um, I know this is going to be variable between, you know, every different person with mm. different lifestyle. Sure. But as a generality, mm-hmm. if somebody said, let's say uh, they come to your office at 50 yep. and they have a coronary artery calcium of say eight, yep. what would you say would be the likelihood of the progression of that to 60, mm. i.e., you know, would it yeah, be it's a about, flat thing yeah, or no, it's few, about 20% per year. 20% per year. Yeah, so if you do the sums on that, 20% per year, I mean, I'm not doing it in yeah, my yeah, head, but you, yeah. you might go from eight to 60 over. So every 10 years, you'd be really looking yeah. at really dramatically yeah, well, And I, I, for people that have low calcium scores, I repeat the calcium score every five years. Right, okay. Okay, if you've got a high calcium score, so just say your calcium score is getting a 250, 300 plus, it's a waste of time doing it again because... When, when, even if you have it done on the same machine five minutes later, you can't absolutely guarantee you're in exactly the same mm, position. Mm. They start the scanning from exactly the same spot at the suprasternal notch. You have the same breath hold that they're at the same time in your cardiac cycle. So even slight variations in that can take your score from 350 to 450 or 350 to, and you wouldn't believe how, how much, just because of the brainwashing by the medical profession in patients, how much people are so fixated on numbers. I had a woman come in the other day, oh, doctor, have you seen what's happened to my cholesterol? And it had gone from 5.2 to, up, up to 5.4. I said, yeah, so what? 
but my tri- triglycerides doctor have gone from 0.7 to 1. I said that could have been the Chinese meal you had the night before the test. Check yeah. for the test next time. Mm-hmm. But I, I'm just saying we get too obsessed with numbers, and this is what disturbs me. you got this fat slob goes into the doctor, and doctor, I've got a cholesterol problem. So the doctor, I can fix that, Lipitor next. Yeah. And the guy walks out going, oh, phew, I didn't get a lecture about being fat. And the doctor goes, oh, phew, I didn't have to talk to the mm-hmm. patient. And then the perception is given to the public by the medical profession that the key to good health is lowering a number in your bloodstream. Not good. Mm. Talk to us about plaques. When we're talking about calcification of a plaque, yep. an unstable plaque, yep. even a necrotic plaque, yep. what are they and can we actually regress them? Yeah, the, the answer is yes to maybe all of the above, but just let me explain to you what happens, okay? What we're talking about here is the condition that everyone's heard of, atherosclerosis. Now, atherosclerosis can even start in utero if the mother is a smoker or has high cholesterol or whatever. And little bits of what we call fatty streaks, streaks build yeah. up in the wall of the aorta. That's been shown in, in children who tragically were stillborn. Uh, I'm not saying that's the cause, but they showed when they did an autopsy that there were streaks in the aorta already, already in that circumstance. But as soon as your mother gives you baby food, which is full of synthetic muck, little droplets of fat start to increase in the wall of your artery. So we're talking about a disease that occurs for decades in a pre-symptomatic phase. And here's where many people get it wrong. Everyone thinks what happens is cholesterol slowly closes over the arteries. Complete nonsense. Imagine a donut, hole in the middle, all the blood's going through the middle, the fat's swelling outwards in the wall of the donut. And then what happens when that fat reaches a critical mass, it suddenly ruptures. That's what an acute coronary syndrome is. And this is really interesting because I want to drill down on this quite a bit. The body uses calcium as a strengthening agent, so it grows into the plaque to try and stabilize a fatty plaque. Now, the more fat you have in the plaque, the more dangerous it is and the more it it has a tendency to rupture. But here's the deal. If you have the standard risk factors for heart disease, so the sedentary guy in his 60s who smokes and he's maybe a bit of diabetes there, his blood pressure's up a bit, the cholesterol's not that good and he suddenly has a heart attack. That's a typical cardiac rupture. So I make the analogy to my patients that if you've got a big juicy pimple and you squeeze it, all the pus comes out suddenly. That's what happens with a cardiac rupture of a big fatty plaque full of muck, ruptures into the channel, Mm. splits open into the channel, and a clot forms over where all the muck is and causes the heart attack. But here's here's the drum. You also have plaque erosion. Now, if you imagine a red pimple that doesn't have a lot of pus that you squeeze that, not a lot of pus comes out, but it basically just splits open and a bit of blood comes out. Now, that's what happens in younger people who don't have much of a cholesterol issue, don't have a lot of atherosclerosis, maybe a zero calcium score, and they still have a heart attack because they erode a plaque. Much more common with inflammation and with thromboses, whereas cholesterol is not a big issue there, it's inflammation and thrombosis. So when you hear about a 45-year-old woman's had a heart attack and their cholesterol wasn't that big a deal and somebody might have done a calcium score, who knows why, and it was zero, but they've still had a heart attack. See, that calcium score stuff doesn't work. No, no, no. It's a different problem. It's plaque erosion more caused by inflammation and, and tendency to thrombosis. So for example, when you hear a 25-year-old woman took the pill for a month and has a stroke... They want, to sue Quant- they, they want to sue Bayer for, for making the pill, or someone has a big clot in their legs uh, traveling from here to uh, over to Heathrow yep. and wants to sue Qantas because they've got the economy syndrome. They should be suing their relatives for giving them the genes such as factor V laden, uh, prothrombin complex abnormality, antithrombin 3 deficiency, protein S, protein C, MTHFR gene, abnormality, LP, little a, or whatever it is, one of those things. Yeah. That thickens your blood. So you take the pill and the pill was just the precipitant for your lousy genes. You have some inflammatory process going on. You get a bad dose of influenza. A study out of University of New South Wales showed that people who have a flu vaccine every year have a 30% reduction in heart attack because they're reducing the inflammatory switch on by the influenza. A bad bout of pneumonia switches on your inflammatory system. I say it's like having a security guard on crack, shoots before he asks questions. So the immune system's all fired up, sees a fatty plaque, erodes into it, and causes erosion, not rupture, because of the activation of the, of the immune system. So So recently, we've just seen the release of a thing called the CANTOS trial, Mm. where they used a monoclonal antibody called canakinumab, and this this thing targets a thing called interleukin-1. 
Now, the results of that were pretty disappointing. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, Because they were all throwing uh, up their uh, hands. I thought it was a cracker uh, because they thought, we now know that inflammation plays a, heart, no, a, a I, part in heart I'll, disease. I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> But, but the, the Cantos trial showed that the, in the placebo group, the amount of heart attacks okay. was something like 4.1 per 100 person years. The, peop- the people who were treated with 150 milligrams of canakimumab, which was the sweet spot dose, the, it was something like 3.86 per 100 person years. So it was a, a 15% reduction in heart attack with the a- average. It, it was statistically significant, but it was pretty marginal. But is that clinically 0.02. significant? Really? I don't know. Well, well, let me tell you, a mate of mine in Perth called Dr. Mark Nidoff has done a thing called the Ladoco trial in his own practice. This is, this is just extraordinary work by a very, very good cardiologist. And what Mark did was gave, gave his patients who ha- had acute coronary syndromes who came in, over the next three years, placebo-controlled trial gave them 500 micrograms of colchicine, the, the drug used for gout, yeah. because it also has very good anti-inflammatory properties. Now, the placebo group had a 16% recurrence rate of acute coronary syndrome, whereas the people given colchicine had a 5% recurrence. That's huge. Yeah, it's massive. So Much that's uric acid as a risk factor for coronary yeah, heart yeah. disease. But, but, but also just the anti-inflammatory effects of the colchicine, much stronger than the very, very expensive canakinamab. So hang on, not just working on uric acid, but as an anti-inflammatory yeah, in general. Yeah, general. Anti, anti-inflammatory, anti-fibrotic agent. It stabilizes the plaque. You see, we're talking about plaque stuff, and that's where statins work. Mm. Statins, yes, of course, they reduce cholesterol. Anyone who doesn't believe that's an idiot. Of course, statins block HMG-CoA reductase, so have a significant rede- uh, prevention of, um, of reduction in LDL levels. There is no doubt about that, as do these new PCSK9 inhibitors. They pulverize LDL cholesterol with, again, a weak benefit on clinical events, weak benefit. So when, 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 you do, when you give a statin, you actually do stabilize the plaque if people have plaque in the first place. And that's my only concern. See, I'm, I'm still- So a find semi- out if they have plaque. Yeah, I'm still a semi-orthodox cardiologist, semi-orthodox, but, but, and I treat people with heart disease aggressively. I've had about four people in the last week I've sent off for angiograms with high-grade lesions that need either stenting or bypass. I totally believe in all that stuff. But what I'm saying is w- the concern I have is that all the information of benefits of all of these drugs come in the very high risk groups. And what the medical profession have done is extrapolate them down to people who are very low, low risk. risk, who have no evidence of significant plaques. And they're still p- filling the eyeballs with all these drugs. So can you change a plaque? You can stabilize it. Yeah, you can, can you ch- make oh, it less necrotic? Oh, can you yeah, change abs- the fatty acid composition? All of the above. Of course you can. Look, many, many years ago, a mate of mine in, in the US called Dean Ornish did a study called the Californian Lifestyle Study. And this had nothing to do with drugs. He basically put people on this really rigid, low-fat diet, which I don't agree with, um, but a really rigid diet that, that no one could stick to anyhow. 10% fat, veg, pure vegetarian diet. Mm. Five times a week supervised exercise program with a little defibrillator sitting in the corner. These people had coronary disease. And, and here, here's the big deal. You mentioned stress before. Week, weekly encounter group where they all sat around speaking about their, their life and their feelings and everything else, but daily one hour of meditation. And these right. people had a significant regression with no drugs of their coronary artery disease. Now, I believe there's quite a bit of work. A, a, a mate of mine, another mate of mine in California called Professor Matt Budoff, who works at the uh, University of California in Los Angeles. He did a study on aged garlic extract and found regression after 12 months of using a, a high potency aged garlic extract. So there are so many, ev- there's so much evidence of high quality natural medicines combined with lifestyle where you can regress plaque. And the, then again, if you've got quite severe disease, I'll bring in the statins as well and I'll bring in whatever other trick there is to bring in with some evidence base behind it. Fish oil. Yep. Can I have a comment? It was, you know, the Gissy P, the Gissy HF, it was all, you know, what is it? Roberto Marcioli was, yeah, was the yeah. proponent of this. Yep. And then Roberto Marcioli did a trial where he said, no, nah, it doesn't work. Mm. So <laughs> what well, are, where are we at with a fish little, There's a little known place in the US called the Mayo Clinic, one of the greatest <laughs> institutions in the world. And uh, the Mayo Clinic published in their, the Mayo Clinic proceedings in January of 2017, this year, published a meta-analysis of all the fish oil trials. Okay, and they found that the the randomised control stuff, which only went for a couple of years, didn't do much. And here's here is the key point I'd like people to get. 
okay? Mm. But when they looked at the trials that were done beyond five years, there was an 18% reduction in cardiovascular disease. Fish oil, multivitamins, bergamot, ubiquinol, vitamin K2, aged garlic, magnesium orotate, all these things work, but they don't work quickly like drugs. And here's the point. A pharmaceutical drug is like a high-performance motor car. It gets you from A to B very quickly, but with the potential of crashing and damaging yourself, possibly even killing yourself. So for a high-performance motor car, you've got to have seat belts, you've got to have all these safety requirements, you've got to have all these rules around driving. Whereas I see supplements like a bicycle, get you from A to B much slower, but you get some exercise along the way. So Probably much, enjoy yourself. Yeah, so a, a lot, lot much, much more contemplative, but it takes a lot longer to get there. So, so when you look at most of the studies of supplements, the, in the short term, they don't do much. The, the male physicians trial, the nurses' health study, they've been done in Harvard for the last 30 years. Multivitamins, for example, up to 10 years did absolutely nothing. I have patients take a multivitamin for a few months and say, I didn't feel any different doctor, so I stopped. But when you get to 10 years in the males, this is randomized control stuff. We're mm -hmm. not talking about just observational. Randomized control trial in the males, there was an 8% reduction in cataracts and common cancers. Now you say, well, 8% is not much, much Ross, but it's take, only take a multivitamin yeah, every day. Yeah, Give yeah. me, and this is additive randomized control trial. Mm. When they got to the observational data in the nurses at 15 years, there was a 75% reduction in bowel cancer, 25% reduction in breast cancer. There was a 23% reduction in cardiovascular disease. Now, when you got to the, the and just released a couple of years ago, the 20 year data randomized control data in the males, those who took a multivitamin every day, a 44% reduction in cardiovascular disease. What you get with a statin, but it takes 20 years to do it. Mm. So you've got to be in it for the long haul. And here's the problem, whether we're talking about statin therapy, blood pressure treatment, multivitamins, or any sort of supplements, only 50% of people are still taking the prescribed treatment after 12 months. Compliance is dreadful because human beings are human beings. They just give up and they go, oh, I ran out. I forgot to reorder or whatever, and then oh, I didn't go back to my doctor and get the script. And so that's why we're not seeing the great benefits we should be seeing with all of these things, because people aren't in it for the long haul. Back again to the LDL molecule. Okay. <laughs> we keep coming back. <laughs> Lipoprotein little a, APO B to APO A, yep. or APO yep. A to APO B. Yep. Tell us about these. What are their risk factors? What's their importance? Okay. And what do we need to do to control them? Right. Well, firstly... Uh, lipoprotein delay is one of the major cardiovascular risk factors. One in five people wandering around the streets have a high level of, level of LP delay in their bloodstream. The problem is the randomized controlled trials have shown no, no difference treating it because there is no real treatment. There's a, there's a new CT, CETP inhibitor called anisetrabid, which does have an effect on LP delay and has just been shown to have a reasonable benefit in cardiovascular mortality, unlike the older ones, which have been shown to increase cardiovascular mortality. Yeah, so, so watch this space, anisetrabid mm. may, may do something. But I still, uh, even though there isn't any strong evidence base in terms of a randomized controlled trial, I still routinely use in all of my patients a combination of vitamin E, vitamin C, and lysine. So lysine, which is used for cold sores, 1,000 milligrams of lysine, I think blocks the lysol re residues on the LP little a molecule and stops it getting into the, the wall of the arteries. And the vitamin C, vitamin E. Now, again, let's talk about that. Here's another great story. In 2004, a guy called Edgar Miller did a, um, an editorial in the Annals of Internal Medicine saying vitamin E not only doesn't work, but may even increase mortality. Now, that was done from an analysis of high-dose vitamin E. He looked at 11 trials. Eight of the 11 were monotherapy, and most of those trials were, as you say, DL-alpha-decopherol, which is synthetic rubbish which should not be used, okay? The only three trials where they combined vitamin E with vitamin C, because in my view, vitamin E doesn't work without vitamin C. So the only three trials where they combined vitamin, vitamin E with vitamin C, they used synthetic vitamin E. So they're using the rubbish vitamin E and they showed a slightly higher trend towards mortality in people in these trials, these 11 trials. But they completely ignored the only two trials in the history of evidence-based medicine where they've taken natural vitamin E with vitamin C both of those trials, the, the IVUS trial, the IVUS trial and the ASAP trial, both showed a 25% reduction in the progression of atherosclerosis when you combine the two things together. So I use CE and lysine for LP little a, and people who have a very high risk, they've either had 
um, very high calcium score, or they've already had clinical heart disease, I try to encourage them to take short acting, short acting nicotinic acid. And, the, and you see, there's been a good huge, old flushing, good old flushing, acid, and, yeah. and, and look, it works not, better than the long term, right? The long term stuff release. doesn't work. Two major trials showed that long acting nicotinic acid doesn't work. No. But the older trials of nicotinic acid, the immediate release stuff, the stuff that gives you the flush, have have shown regression and improvement in in cardiac events. So what I do with my patients, 250 milligram nicotinic acid, get them to cut it into quarters, and then they just gradually build up the dose of, of nicotinic acid over a few months to whatever they can tolerate. Two, two pills twice a day, half a pill twice a day. I don't care as long as they get a bit of flushing for about five minutes twice a day because the flushing is telling them that the stuff's opening up their microvasculature. But I don't want them to walk around with a red face all day. That's that's ridiculous. And it's so, a horrible itch. Yeah, and, then, <laughs> and the itch really as well. interesting itch. So, so if you just give them a little bit of flushing twice a day, it reminds them the stuff's working. And that has been shown to reduce LP little a by around 25, 30%. So I use nicotinic acid in that situation or in people who've got pretty vicious vascular disease anyhow. So that's a good drug. And I've got to say, vitamin B3 has been getting a really good press lately. It's been getting a great press. The, the, the seminal work from the Garvin Institute at St. Vincent's where they showed that uh, B3, a good old-fashioned niacin, actually reduced birth defects and miscarriages. There's been a lot of work by that wonderful Australian researcher who's now in Harvard, David Sinclair, the anti-aging guy, which is not a topic for today's discussion. But he's been, Next week. He, but he's <laughs> been showing, shown, he has shown in his work that, uh, that vitamin, uh, nicotinamide added to a riboside ring. So nicotinamide riboside actually improves longevity by about 20% in experimental animals. So they're now doing human trials on this as well. So I think B3 has been often the forgotten supplement and we need to really be focusing on different aspects of B3, whether it's nicotinic acid, nicotinamide riboside, or just straight nicotinamide, because there's a very good study using a, a, a product called Insolar that where if you have 500 milligrams twice a day oh, of nicotinamide, cancer, yeah. Yeah. it reduces skin cancer yeah, yeah. risk. For 28% or yeah, something. Yeah, 28% like. reduction. Yeah, yeah over 12 it. months, not that's six it. or something. Yeah. Um, that to me is a really interesting topic for another yeah. day. But I have to ask you about exercise. Mm. We talk about cardio exercise. Yep. Then there's HIIT training. Yep. Uh, I think it was uh, Mark Houston said, do the strength before the cardio. Does this have a real effect on how your cardiac health is affected? Yeah, look, can, can I say I'm not an exercise physiologist and I'm not really sure about the Mickey Mouse aspects of whether you're better off doing strength training before your cardio or whatever. I think the important thing, and th this is the real message here, is you've got to exercise. I mean, that's, that's the point. Whether you're doing one or the other, I don't really think it matters. I think the important thing is that we get what I call the Walker suggested dose of exercise, which is three to five hours every week of some form of exercise. And I think exercise should be about two thirds cardio, a third resistance training. So whether that resistance training is lifting light weights, and I think certainly for people over the age of 50, going crazy with this stuff is ridiculous. I say the only joint you blow over the age of 50 is your hip or your knee. Mm. And I think it's important not to go overboard with exercise when you get to that age. I think exercise can be dangerous. I'll, I'll give you a couple of quick examples. Mm. I had a 65-year-old man who wanted to walk the Kokoda Trail. His daughter, now this is Twilight Zone stuff, his daughter had a dream before he went away that he died in the Kokoda Trail. So she insisted he come in to see me for a cardiac checkup before he did the Kokoda Trail. No symptoms, no history, no major risk factors. Put him on the treadmill, did a stress echocardiogram, takes a picture of the heart with ultrasound before and after exercise. He had no symptoms during the stress test. He had no ECG changes whatsoever, but his echo at the end of exercise almost slowed down to nothing. And I said, let's forget about the Kokoda Trail, put him in the local hospital, severe triple vessel disease, coronary artery bypass grafting. Right. So my message there is that I think exercise is the second best drug on the planet. But if you're listening to this and want to start an exercise program or want to get your patients onto exercise, I think it's get important they should have a cardiovascular check before they do so. I, was, I, I also was one of those stupid old farts that played soccer until I was 52. I've completely destroyed my right knee and that's a topic for another day. But a month before I stopped playing soccer, I was playing over 45 old fart soccer and a 61-year-old man in the opposition drops dead in front of me. Again, people running around a field with, with, uh, without a proper cardiovascular checkup go and play this sport. Now, because he was a fullback, I resuscitated him. If he was a forward, I would let him die. Of course, he's had, <laughs> had bypass surgery within two hours and he's now one of my faithful patients. Yeah. 
But the, the point I'm making here is firstly, if you're going to do exercise, make sure you're well enough to do exercise. Secondly, two thirds cardio, a third resistance, and the resistance can be the light weights or it can be yoga, or it can be Pilates, and the cardio can be whatever cardio you will do. So when, when you get into the Mickey Mouse aspects, whether it should be the high intensity interval training or whether, look, we just want to get people out there exercising, mm -hmm. not to make it too complicated for people. A brisk half an hour walk every day is three and a half hours a week of exercise. Just from doing that, it's better than sitting on your bum. Mm. Now here's the issue, is more better? And the answer is no. The evidence doesn't show that any more than Five hours a week is better for you than three to five hours, which is the sweet spot. It's like red wine. Maybe having no red wine a week is, is doesn't help you. A couple of glasses is good, but once you get above that, you get you get problems. So again, there are some people who do perform high performance exercise. I saw one of my patients who's who's an ultra marathon runner. He's already had a heart attack. He came to see me the other day. He was doing a run from Newcastle to Sydney. I told him there was a perfectly good bus service, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just absolutely ridiculous. But, but look, ex exercise, what does it do for you? If you have a three to five hour a week exercise habit, you reduce your risk for cardiovascular disease, 30%, cancer, 30%, Alzheimer's, 30%, diabetes, 30%, reduce depression, 50% reduction in osteoporosis, mm. drops your blood pressure, and you sleep better. There is no pharmaceutical preparation known to man that is stronger than exercise. There's only one drug on the planet that's better, and that's a thing called happiness. Ah. Uh -huh. Now, there's a whole podcast. It sure is. <laughs> Mindfulness. Happy to do that one as well. Dr. Ross Walker, I can't thank you enough. By goodness, we've tra we've travelled a lot today. But <laughs> well, that's typical of my bizarre You go at the speed of a freight train, I tell you. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us and taking us through the important issues, the undiscovered or the unlooked for issues that, that are evading so many practitioners, particularly medicos, hmm. um, with regards to cardiovascular disease. Number one, coronary artery calcium score. Yep. Lipoprotein little a. Yeah. Insulin resistance. We spoke about the place of LDL cholesterol, whether it is or isn't important. It is in some people, it isn't for other people. We spoke, uh, and most, the most important message I like to give anyone are those five keys of being healthy. Mm. You cannot be healthy, have addictions. We want good quality sleep, good quality eating, and less of it, three to five hours of exercise and happiness. If everyone cultivated those things well in this society, we'd see a marked reduction in all diseases. So that's the major point for today. And, and also, there is, there is very good evidence base around supplementation. So, and the supplements that I encourage all my patients to have, a good multivitamin every day, some form of omega-3, whether it's fish or krill, whatever suits the patient. I'm a great believer in, in the Bergamet Pro Plus. I'm a great believer in ubiquinol. I think ubiquinol is great for energy, but certainly statins and heart failure is great there. And if you want to make it even more powerful, use the magnesium orotate, vitamin K2 to take the calcium out of the arteries, put it back in the bones. And the aged age garlic extract is also very good with studies on reversal and blood pressure control. The only negative th thing I can see coming out of this podcast is I'm going to be hungrier. Dr. Ross Walker, thanks so much. <laughs> good on you, Andrew. <laughs> this is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Don't forget to visit fxmedicine.com.au for today's show notes, extra research and other resources.